All right, friends. So, yeah, just another welcome to the San Francisco Dharma Collective. I'm Eve Ekman, your teacher for this evening. I get to share this teaching evening with Chandra Easton or Lopan Chandra Easton, who some of you may know. And in the last couple months, and, and probably for a couple more months, we've been following this beautiful text called Old Paths, White Clouds. This is the historic telling of the life of the Buddha. And especially tonight, very often different teachings arise and different ways of looking at the same teachings. But tonight, especially, I feel like we get a real sense of the humanness of the Buddha, like his very human experience. Bye, Kai. See you next time. <laughs> um, we get to see the really the human side of the Buddha through when he is coming home for the first time after he's found the awakening and coming home to his homeland, to his father, his wife, his son, who he's never really met. Um, and it's a really, yeah, it's a really sweet story. Um, last week, we were looking at the chapter that was really kind of helping us see that sometimes even the greatest teachings and the greatest stories can actually become an impediment in our spiritual path. So sometimes we take the words that we hear, the teachings that we learn, and we hold on to them so tightly that we actually don't make space for our own recognition for our own awareness, for what is arising in ourself in these practices. So for those of you uh, who've come here before, you know, I, I often provide guidance in the practice and I will this evening as also, but we're going to do a bit less guidance. And the goal of that is really to give ourselves time. I almost think of it as, you know, when you have a guided practice, it's maybe you can have like a hand or two on the side of the pool. You're like, okay, I know where the edge is here. And then maybe you like, you know, just for a moment, take your hands off and you're treading water. And then you're like caught up in your thoughts and memories and ideas. Okay, let's go back to the guidance. Here I am. And tonight we'll give ourselves an opportunity to just, yeah, have a bit more of that spaciousness in our practice. So we'll kind of work with this kind of quality of a simplicity in our practice and a spaciousness in our practice. From last week, one of the, the beautiful analogies is once you have a raft and you make it to the other side of the river, don't keep carrying the raft around with you. A good analogy for that in the practice would be we'll start tonight by counting our breath. It's really nice to count the breath. I know all of you already know how to count and Kai maybe doesn't, but he's gone. So it's not about learning to count, right? But it gives us the single focus of our attention, helps our minds settle. But if we just count for our whole practice, we are kind of doing a practice of counting and, and not really kind of feeling into the meditation and the state and quality of our mind and awareness. And so in that way, we're going to kind of give ourselves a little bit of the structure and then let ourselves be open with just a more kind of gentle anchoring to our breath. So that's going to be our, our practice this evening. Um, one of the instructions I want to revisit from a couple of weeks back, which just just love. So this, this book is compiled by the late great Thich Nhat Hanh, who of course many of you know and love. And he has such a, a poetic way of describing practice. And there's just some, something so simple and profound about a lot of his instructions. I, I haven't really studied in his tradition much, only through his books do I know him as a teacher. And he has this simple instruction, breathing in, I dwell in the present moment, and breathing out, I know this is a wonderful moment. And when we did this practice together a couple of weeks back, it was as an equanimity practice, as a practice of really being able to have a sense of holding everything with spaciousness. And one of the most direct ways to do that is being in this present moment. If we're in this present moment, it is wonderful, right? We feel the fullness of it. And such a big theme in all 58 chapters of this book is a lot of what gets in the way or a lot of what causes our unnecessary suffering is how much extra we put upon the simplicity of being in this moment. 
moment by moment, we put more and more kind of of our grasping or delusion and just confusion around what's happening. We can't just experience it as it is. And for most of us here, we're really fortunate to be in a, in a safe place. It's dry. Uh, we have Noam at the door who's really keeping us safe and protected here. And we can allow ourselves to be in this present moment, right? We actually can be here with a relative sense of ease. So that's an invitation for us to feel that sense of presence and the simple wonderfulness of that presence. Um, one other thing I want to mention is with the San Francisco Dharma Collective and, and how we hold space here, it's really important to us to have our values of the center be spread throughout every part of what we do here. So not just in when you're in meditation, being mindful and having your mind and body saturated in compassion, but also as we are listening to one another and in discussion to really use everything we're doing here as that kind of practice. And that's really high level practice, right? Some of it has to do with the thoughts that might arise, the judgments that might arise as we hear either me speaking or someone else speaking, or we haven't had this in a while. I don't want to call it in, but we have problems with our internet or any technological struggles, like notice your mind, right? Can we have compassion? Can we have a sense of presence with that? And it's so important to have spaces where we can come together and practice. All of us can read this book on our own. We could all watch a recording of this later, but being here in person, it's, it's a rare and precious opportunity, right? Not only that we get to know each other, but we get a sense of our shared struggles with the practices and some of the ways that we reflect after. And also that um, we can learn from noticing our mind, noticing our thoughts, noticing um, our inclinations throughout the practice with one another. I think someone, I think it was last week or the week before, was just describing how different of a quality it is to practice with other people. Um, also online, but in person, just this sense of we are here together. And then the stillness that can happen in this room um, is something quite unique. So now that I've totally oversold it, uh, hopefully, um, hopefully that's a, a positive priming and not a recipe for expectations. Um, so yeah, let's give ourselves a moment to find a posture that will support us in this practice. Practicing together about 20, maybe 30 minutes. It's really nice to have in mind the, the basic structure of this posture, our meditation posture. It's not about the visual aesthetics of it. It's about the internal experience of having our body feel very grounded and very upright. So beginning by if you are sitting in a chair, really feeling like you can have your feet firmly planted on the ground beneath you. And as you're feeling a sense of your feet upon the ground, invite a sense of the ground rising up to meet you, a sense of support. And giving ourselves a moment to find an alignment where the spine can be very upright, not rigid, but tall elegant, like the top of a lily. And finding a place for the hands to rest, either in the earth pressing posture, just directly on top of our thighs or folded in our lap.
And you're welcome to have your eyes slightly open and softly focused in front of you or having the eyes closed. But inviting a sense of softness around the eyes, whatever position they're in. We can just gently bring our shoulders and shoulder blades together in the back so that our chest feels more open in the front. Almost as though the chest were lifting like a chalice or a cup pointed upwards. And feeling the head resting evenly on top of the neck not sloping forward or leaning back. And letting this first bell just help us settle into our body by listening to the entire resonance and tone of the bell. I'll be giving some instructions here in the beginning and then giving us more spaciousness. So let's start off by continuing to settle into the body, by noticing tactile sensations in the body. I'm inviting a quality of stability, the sense of the body being rooted in the chair or on the cushion. Inviting the energy and attention away from the head centers and feel the entire body. No need for words or concepts, just that direct feeling experience of this body in this moment. And for a couple breaths, really feeling the entire body as you're breathing in and continuing that feeling and knowing of the entire body as you're breathing out. And to round off the settling in the body, let's do three breaths, which we lengthen and extend the breath. So inhaling slowly through the nostrils, holding gently at the top and exhaling slowly and gently through the nostrils. And again, slowly inhaling. And slowly exhaling. 
One more time, feeling it all together, inhaling slowly. Exhaling slowly. Inviting our mind to settle more. By following the breath through the subtle sensations at the nostrils, breathing in and breathing out. And considering this an invitation for stillness, not only of body, since we're not moving or reaching for anything, but the stillness of mind, in which we no longer need to think anything or do anything, giving ourselves the commitment, the permission to be fully here. All the thoughts we can return to after our practice. So dropping in by following the breath. And when you become caught up in a distraction, a thought or image, a memory, planning, no problem, just relaxing and releasing and returning to the simple following of the breath as it flows in and out of the nostrils. The more we gather our attention into one place, the more the mind and body can settle. So let's apply a brief practice of counting. On the inhale at the very top, silently we count one and then release the one and exhale, making our way up to 10. If we find ourselves distracted, we can just return to the accounting, starting again at one.
in the counting, we can maybe find ourselves both counting and distracted at the same time. Again, not a problem, but just really catching ourselves, developing that incredible skill of meta awareness, being able to recognize where our mind has wandered and then inviting it back. Being compassionate with ourselves whenever we find ourselves distracted. Being compassionate to the distractions. Maybe it's a sound outside. Maybe it's a thought inside. If you're counting, releasing the counting for now. And taking a moment here together to set an intention. Remembering that this practice and every practice we do for the sake not only of our own well-being, but for all beings. In many ways, this practice of strengthening our compassion and awareness is the very best thing we can do for this world. Considering what our intention is this evening, what feels motivating, inspiring, it could be a word or a phrase. It is often said the intention can be the most important part of our practice, where we align our values with this present moment. And dedicate ourselves, helping us remember why we're here, and what we are practicing for. Taking a moment to, again, check in with the body, notice sensations in the body. Notice feeling tone in the body, maybe something that feels pleasant or unpleasant. Our body is such an amazing way to be in the present moment. Breathing in, dwelling in the present moment. Breathing out, knowing this is a wonderful moment. And we can keep this gentle anchor of dwelling in the present moment with our inhales, maybe feeling into the wonder of the moment through our exhales, 
but also allowing ourselves some spaciousness. So between following the breaths, allowing the mind and body to feel open, vast, And seeing if we can rest in that sense of vastness and openness, not in a dull, lethargic way, in a luminous, vivid, present way of our own awareness. Using any sound, just as we would use any thought as a, a reminder to help us come back, deepen into our practice. At any time, if the mind just feels too dull or too busy, you can come back to counting, maybe for five breaths. And then allowing yourself that wide pasture, that vast feeling spaciousness, sky-like mind. each moment or cycle of breath in which you're fully present 
can be all the riches of a meditation. There's no problem with getting distracted and coming back. And giving yourself what you need in this practice. If you need the breath as an anchor, using the breath. And if you want to continue leaning back in the mind, and continue inviting the spaciousness of sky-like mind. Nothing to see, nothing to point out or do, just being, resting. Checking in with the body. Seeing if there's areas of tension that want to continue to release. And invite that relaxation and release through the next exhale. This practice, this connecting with our presence, our awareness, our breath, this could possibly be the most important skill or tool we could cultivate. And let that possibility be further motivation to help us keep coming back, coming back never making thoughts or distractions a problem, just relaxing, releasing, and returning.
Reconnecting to the body, feeling this full body of awareness, <clears throat> feeling the body meditating you instead of you meditating in your body. And for our remaining moments of practice, continue to invite this full presence in the body. Could even feel or imagine this body as a body of light. A sense of transparency or lightness. And while remaining in our body, inviting a sense of awareness of the space around us, the beings who are gathered here, the clouds that are just above us here. A sense of this moment and this hour and this season. And this breath, which connects each of us.
Thank you for your, excuse me, thank you for your practice. It's just so wonderful to feel the stillness in this room and to experience that from you all. Really appreciate that. I hope you can feel that online a little bit as well. <laughs> Thank you. Questions, <clears throat> comments, delusions, <laughs> objections, anything about your practice. It's so helpful and valuable for us to share our practice insights and questions with one another. Certainly, whatever you ask or reflect on, some version of that is in the room. And it's really interesting. We can kind of have practice end up being something that's separate from our life. Like, it's like, oh, I just go do this thing and I don't even like, it's just, it's just there. Um, and we don't, in, in, I don't, interrogate's not the right word. We don't investigate. Um, and if we're not curious about our practice and the quality of our practice, we might actually end up um, kind of circling around some habits in our practice and, and getting a little stuck, right? So it's really important to like think about, hmm, what was the quality of that practice for me? Did it feel spacious? Did it feel narrow? How was my attention? Was it jumping everywhere? Was it kind of sluggish? So these introspective questions can help us refine our understanding of our practice and also learn about it. So yeah, if anyone is interested and willing to share, we have this microphone that can travel um, and friends online as well are welcome. And please say your name if you choose to bravely share. Yes, thanks, Raf. Hey, I'm Raf. Um, I had a very jumpy, I really felt the, I, I'm, I'm swimming, I'm in the middle of the pool. Yeah. And I'm like treading in water and then like, <laughs> <laughs> like it's kind of quite challenging. And um, when you expressed it, that thought about what is your intention? Why are mm. you here? Uh, it, I, you, you said that just as I was, my jumpiness was making me think like, why am I being so jump? Like, why is my brain wanting mm. to have these thoughts? I, I, and um, I was kind of in a bit of a loop of like, why? Mm. Why do you want to think about this right now, brain? I was like trying to do the, you don't have to, it's good. Yeah. And it would go back. And, and and it just made me think about um how I hadn't really articulated the counter intention. Mm. Like the default intention was think about solve all the things that are not that you can't solve right now. Mm. Like play a game of pretending to solve them in your head mm. in a situation where it's not gonna help. Especially the part of my brain that was trying to solve stuff that had, you know was in the future, which by definition I can't help with right now. Um, so yeah, that question of like, what is the, why not do that was something that hmm. I really thought about. And did, so- Did you come up with an answer? Why not spend the meditation planning? An answer. It, it was, it made me think about how some of the things that I was struggling with in my head were, all situations where I had, there were various situations coming up for me where I was, I had felt suffering hmm. because I had reacted in a way to something that something someone had said or a situation in a way that made me feel unsafe or stressed or, hmm. and where if it had been possible for me to just be present Hmm. and just take it without feeling stressed or unsafe or hmm. unhappy or triggered in any way. I, I would have been better off. Hmm. 
the other person would have had to change their behavior or the situation would have had to change. I just would have had experienced less suffering mm. if I had just been able to expand the range of things that yeah. made me not feel bad, basically. Yeah. yeah. And that's what was coming to mind. That's what was coming to mind. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that honesty. I think, you know, it is quite interesting what comes to mind in our practice, right? Like what comes to the surface and it's especially interesting for those who've um, had the opportunity to be on retreat because I've noticed that especially the first day um, and especially your first retreats, it's like a lot of the kind of unmetabolized pain and suffering and, and difficulties that rise to the surface. And I don't think it means you're doing anything wrong. In fact, it's possible that it is this kind of stuff sorting up to be purified or to be not actually taking up this energy and part of your mind you don't usually attend to, right? Again, I, I hate using computer analogies for the mind, but in the big web browser screen, right? There's like that one tab and it's like surf line, right? And it's like taking up a lot of bandwidth. There's videos. You don't even know that tabs open. Like, like 50 tabs. There's like 50 tabs <laughs> and you're meditating in that. And it's like, I think, I do think you can become aware of stuff that's, it's not that it's coming up only in meditation. It, it's there. And when you create the conditions where there is more space, you kind of see it more clearly. It bubbles up. And I, and again, you know, I do think so beautiful. My, uh, my kind of root teacher, my first teacher, Alan Wallace, I, I've mentioned this before, but almost every um, piece of advice he gives, especially for content during meditation is relax more. And I, I and it's not just like relax, go dull. It's like existentially relax. Like thought coming up about a difficult situation, no problem. Thought coming back about the situation, no problem. And not in a, that situation isn't a problem. It might literally be a problem and something to deal with, but we can have that sense of a kind of existential ease around the material that's coming up. And as you said, especially when it's future material, it's like we're practicing how to be with rumination. And our day to day, when we're not meditating, just ruminating, right? And we're not practicing how to be with it. So we can almost consider it like the laboratory of our practice. And so I'm curious, like, how were you with it? Did it feel like a problem or was it possible to relax with it? It felt like, um, it, no, it didn't feel like a problem. It felt like, uh, how did it feel? It's a good question. It felt like, Kind of felt like um, I don't know, like closing my eyes, and then every every few seconds, or like I don't know how, how whatever the amount of time, like waves. But it's like someone walking up me, like, "Oh, here's some. Can you like sign this paperwork? Or like, here's this thing. Can you deal with this?" Yeah, like, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And then get distracted a little bit, and hand it back, and say, "Okay, cool." And then they would come back. So can you now deal with this thing? Hmm. That's kind of what the feeling was like. Yeah, I can. I can see that in my mind's eye. And, you know, I do think in general, but in, in this practice, too, that coming back to the body, not as a way to suppress or avoid or deny what's going on in the mind. But even, you know, when certain thoughts arise, like we notice some thoughts are stickier. They're like faster, they're pointier, they might feel like spicier even. And instead of kind of conceptually or with our analytic mind thinking like, what's up with this thought? This one, notice how has this shifted and changed my body? And we're kind of shifting the, the area and focus of our attention. And when we start relaxing or noticing in the body, um, ideally it can help the mind settle a bit. So it's a really great way to both learn about the shifts and changes in our body and kind of redirect or, you know, in the psychological literature, the most effective emotion regulation strategy, reappraisal, you know, just having a different way of meeting what's difficult. So we can do that with a word or a phrase. But we can also just do that by re 
uh, focusing our attention on the body, what's happening in the body. It's okay. I'm here in the body. So thank you. (laughs) Yeah. And some of these things I know they may not hit, but sometimes it, there we go. Cause sometimes that's, sometimes that's where we are. Right. And we're not in this control station here, looking down on the body. We're like in the body. So thank you. Yeah. Any other jewels or gems or muck from the bottom of the pond that you dredged up in practice? Yes. Okay. My name is Paul, and I think this may relate, maybe, I just wanted to share something that may relate to what Alan Wallace was saying about relaxing and what you said about reappraisal. And one of the things I've noticed is that when I first started meditating, I think I viewed it as a very deep, earnest exercise. (laughs) You know, I'm going to get into some real deep, earnest stuff. Uh, But what I've found over time is that often the most rewarding sits I have are when there's a really strong element of playfulness and humor Mm. and lightness that if you're always, for me, if I'm always trying to have that deep, earnest meditation, it actually force, it pushes away lightness. And I, just to make this a little less abstract, I was kind of hoping Chandra would be here too, because a couple of years ago, I did the feeding the demon stuff. By the way, my demon's a rat, but it's a rat. <laughs> and I was having these meditations where the rat would appear like uninvited. And he was usually wearing overalls. <laughs> and he was often raking like a Zen garden <laughs> and just laughing. Hmm. Laughing like it, I think at me for taking myself so seriously, like get over yourself. And he just thought that my attempts at earnestness were hysterical love it it was like a reoccurring presence but like whenever i saw that rat with the rake i was like this is actually something good's about to happen yeah mm-hmm. uh, so i don't i don't know if that's a way of like triggering reappraisal or relaxing oh, but i yeah there's like a playfulness or comedy element to it that i i used to think wasn't serious meditation but i'm starting to like it i i appreciate that mm-hmm. yeah and that's and- funny yeah. And I do think it's um, we can get into a bit of like a self-serious solemnness with our practice. And it's so wonderful when that like deep stillness hits us. And it's it is it's not even solemn or serious, but it's just such a deep stillness. Beautiful. But I think often we try to like force that you know, with the kind of, oh, I'm going to kind of like meditate so hard. And uh, a friend and co-teacher of mine, Ryan Redman, he points to this, you know, line in between his brow of his first 10 years of meditation practice, like, (laughs) you know, just trying to do it so hard. Um, And it it can be really nice to have that gentleness, um, the Beautiful teacher, Sokni Rinpoche, who I've often mentioned here, he often uses humor in his teaching, like literally really funny, Um, very self-deprecating, but also helping um, people laugh about themselves. And he says that laughter opens the subtle body. And so laughing a bit before we practice, you know, and maybe even being together and eating delicious food can like help with that dropping in. Um, and that sense of we need some level of psychological safety to even consider dropping into stillness. So, yeah, and I appreciate the rat with the overall. So hopefully he'll show up for all of us now. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. Yeah. Any other delusions? That was good. Was hallucinations, visions, questions or comments uh, on practice. Uh, my name is Chris, and I had kind of a similar experience. And what I love is uh, Jack Cornfield's metaphor of the puppy. Mm-hmm. You, say, be, you stay a little puppy and the puppy wanders off and you have to just put the puppy back. Mm-hmm. And so I know that in 
in the, where I am in the development of my practices, I am such a puppy. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But what really resonated with me was when you said, this really is the most important skill you can develop. And that when those things do rise up, the metaphor I like is um, then they're available to to metabolize them Mm -hmm. and to actually turn them into something energetic. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. I think we're all eternally in puppy face with the mind wandering off. And, you know, the beauty of that of that teaching is you don't yell at the puppy. Right. And we do kind of get to see how hard we can be on ourselves as our mind is wandering. And especially if it's content we're really tired of that we didn't invite in and it keeps coming, you know, and uh, one of my close friends and Dharma brothers says, he says to me, the planning mind is strong in you, right? I'm very good at planning, you know, and uh, it's, it is, it's really humbling, especially like you're saying, Raph, when you're like, no, 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 I came for practice. I didn't come for the to-do list. Um, and how can we be gentle? How can we be kind with this puppy or sometimes called the wild stallion of the mind? Um, And I do think it's interesting, you know, we started the practice variety is a ways of settling into the body, settling the speech, settling the mind, counting of the breath. And one of the metaphors that's been given for this wild stallion of the mind is, you know, how do we slowly bring kind of a, an area of more focused attention, but not go there super quickly, not go, okay, sit down, focus on the breath right at the nose. So that's almost like you're forcing in a lot of this energy into a small place. Um, maybe next week, there's, there's a practice we haven't done in a while where you're actually oscillating breath by breath between this more spacious awareness and this focused attention. So much to be gained from that oscillation between really allowing ourselves that spaciousness and then inviting in that focused attention. It's, I think it's like a high intensity interval training for the mind. Um, Just really, really beneficial. And, you know, I I do offer it as a possibility that this is the most important training. I, I won't force anyone. It's absolutely up to you to see if that feels true. Um, But in the world we're living in, um, and even of course the historic world of the Buddha, like that just, so many things that need our calm, present attention, that need us to be compassionate and sane. And if there was a quicker, funner way to do it, I would be on board. We should all do that. But I don't think there is. I saw your hand there. Did you want to? Hi, I'm Emma. Um, I think what I noticed was tension in my shoulders Mm. that I associate with stress. Yeah. And I was reflecting on that because I started a new job recently that is much less stressful than my old job. (laughs) So it was sort of an opportunity to realize that my body is remembering stress that my mind is not feeling and that I need to kind of maybe make sure I'm giving myself space to sit in less tense positions and move around more and mm. that so that my body can unlearn. Yeah. Um, Beautiful. Yeah. yeah. That's such great noticing. And I do think absolutely moving around and, and a lot of ways we take care of our body, but the practice itself, you know, and um, some of those patterns and habits are in the subtle body, right? Not just the form or the physical body, but in the way that we have kind of stored these emotions in the body. And I notice myself when I drop into practice, often there's like a lot of facial tension that starts to like unwind and get soft. And it is that like daily holding. And I could definitely, you know, get one of Gwyneth Paltrow's like $500 thing and like massage my face. But I find that during practice, it naturally releases like, again, that core sense of relaxation, not just falling asleep. Sleep is great. Sleep is one form of deep recovery. But what about the kind of recovery from like that, like conscious presence with ourselves? So, yeah. Thank you. So I think we'll move... It's a beautiful story, story time here. 
Yeah, oh. Eve, I just, I yeah. think that someone had their hand up. On okay. Line. No, we're good. Stuff it. Okay. okay. Yeah, don't be shy. Thank you for, for calling that out. Was that a no or a yes? You're welcome. I said I had a question, but you addressed it already. Thank you. Okay. Good. <laughs> Thank you. So again, um, for folks who maybe haven't been here in a couple of weeks or maybe at all, we are catching up with Buddha. This is his third year after awakening. Um, and he spent seven years finding the way. So leaving his home um, as a prince in a very beautiful part of the land and determined as he was to find something that would help us truly meet suffering, <clears throat> not just temporary alleviate suffering. And he promised when he left uh, to himself, because he left in the middle of the night, he couldn't really tell anybody. Um, he promised that he would come back and teach the way to his family and, and his people. And as I was mentioning in the beginning of our time, I just found these next couple of chapters, it's like very, very human, you know, like the Buddha had a dad and the dad really missed him. And something about that just, it really struck me um, in this, the humanness of it. So I'm going to read us <clears throat> um, a couple uh portions here of when he has his reunion with his dad. And then we'll pick up on a couple of themes about his coming back and the teachings he offers when he comes back. So the king has heard because some one of the monks went ahead and, and let the whole kingdom know that the Buddha was on his way. And when he gets close, the king rides out on his horse and the king recognized that this monk who was clad in a saffron robe was indeed his own son. The Buddha radiated majesty and seemed almost surrounded by a halo of light. He was standing, holding his bowl in front of a shabby dwelling. In his serene concentration, it appeared that the act of begging was at that moment the most important thing in his life. The king watched as a woman dressed in a tattered clothes came out of the poor hut and placed a small potato in the Buddha's bowl. The Buddha respectfully received it by bowing to the woman. He then moved on to the next house. Um, and the king just kind of watches him for a while. He doesn't want to intervene. And then he comes in front of the Buddha and he says, Siddhartha, and the Buddha says, Father. And the Buddha um, grabs on to the king's hands in his own two hands. Tears streamed down the king's wrinkled cheeks. The Buddha gazed at his father, his eyes filled with loving warmth. The king understood that Siddhartha was no longer the crown prince, but a respected spiritual teacher. He wanted to embrace Siddhartha, but felt that it might not be proper. Instead, he joined his palms and bowed to his son in the manner that a king greets a high-ranking teacher. Um, mm -hmm. The king looked long and hard at Buddha before saying, I thought surely you would come to the palace to see your family first. Who could have guessed you would have instead go begging in the city? Why didn't you come to eat at the palace? My God, I can feel the craving and longing and like guilting in that. Like, hmm, like imagine that you would have gone everywhere else but here. How interesting. And it's, you know, you can feel him like trying to kind of, I don't know, like just in that parental way, we do it with our partners too, you know, like, oh, interesting. You didn't come say hi. Um, and the Buddha, not, you know, most of us in reuniting with our families, like regress to age, what, seven, eight, nine, ten. But the Buddha, luckily, with his enlightenment, simply smiled at his father. Father, I am not alone. I have trained with a large community. Oh, I've traveled with a large community, the community of bhikkhus. I too am a bhikkhu and like all others beg for my food. And he says, but must you beg for your food at such poor dwellings as these? No one in the history of the Sakya clan has ever done such a thing. <laughs> and this is like, oh, dad. <laughs> Like, how could you? Uh, and again, the Buddha smiled. 
Um, this is like the true test of your awakening, right? I, I think I've mentioned this here before, but like come back from your week long, three week long retreat. And for me, it's like, okay, go have dinner with my parents and see, <laughs> see what's really transpired in this time away. Um, and he said, he smiles and he says, perhaps no Sakya has ever done this before, but all bhikkhus have father begging is a spiritual practice, which helps a bhikkhu develop humility and that see all persons are equal. When I receive a small potato from a poor family, it is no different than when I receive an elegant dish served by a king. A bhikkhu can transcend the barriers that discriminate between rich and poor. On my path, are all are considered equal. Everyone, no matter how poor he is, can attain liberation and enlightenment. Begging does not demean my own dignity. It recognizes the in inherent dignity in all persons. And so throughout these chapters, you see how the Buddha is using these like really simple kind of human emotions that the father is expressing as these beautiful teaching opportunities. And we spoke about begging a couple weeks ago, but I just love him highlighting that this practice, it just helps instantiate humility over and over recognizing our interdependence and, and without preference. Right. And, it's interesting, <clears throat> hard to imagine for most of us in our contemporary life to have this kind of humility and this kind of practice of relying entirely on others. And yet we rely upon others for everything, you know, and what does it take for us to see that? And there might be ways that we rely on people that we consider higher than others, but every single piece of food that we have put in our mouth today relies on dozens if not hundreds of people and so even having that awareness and helping us find the humility in this moment can be really beautiful practice um the next yeah the next so then you know there he is the king coming into the palace and uh, his wife Yasodahara and their son Rahula who's now seven years old um, gets to kind of catch the first glimpse of, of the Buddha and the, his son Rahula kind of runs downstairs and gets to embrace him all very beautiful. And then he comes to see his wife and uh, his stepmother who started taking care of Buddha only a week after the Buddha was born. And the two women begin to cry. Their tears were tears of joy. And the Buddha let them silently weep. And then he asked the, his son to sit behind him. His, his mother or his uh, stepmother wiped her tears with the edge of her sari and smiling at the Buddha said, you were gone a very long time. More than seven years have passed. Do you understand how courageous a woman your wife has been? And he says, I have long understood the depth of her courage. You and Yasodhara are the two most courageous women I know. Not only have you offered understanding and support to your husbands, but you are models of strength and determination for all. I've been very lucky to have both of you in my life. It has made everything so much easier. And what's interesting that we see play out in these next couple of chapters and actually in the years ahead is the Buddha's wife and mother, they become the first nuns. It takes a really long time, much longer than I think it should for women to be accepted in the Sangha, but they really get the teachings just really instantaneously. The king doesn't come around, spoiler alert. Um, you know, maybe there's just too much entrenched of his own conditioning and his position and responsibility. And in the chapter just following this, the Buddha, as he often does, is telling a story to the children. And in the story he's telling to the children, it's how he understands his wife and his connection throughout many lifetimes. And in that, he says that they have this vow created many, many lifetimes ago when they kind of made eye contact and instantly fell in love. But this Buddha of many lifetimes ago was already determined for awakening. She said, I've never felt this way. I, I want to spend my life with you. And he said, I'm here for awakening. And, uh, and she says, I will, when the time comes, I will support you every time. 
and they make this vow uh, and for lifetimes upon lifetimes that is their contract and it's it's beautiful um, and interesting to think of the different ways that we, whether or not you believe in, in past lives or future lives, these different ways that we show up to support one another. And um, I, I definitely don't profess to know a whole lot about how we bring all of our relationship to the spiritual path, but we should, right? Like our, our relationships shouldn't be outside of our spiritual practice. And how can we support those that we care about in their spiritual awakening and development, whatever that looks like, that might not look like meditation for them. So I really appreciate the respectfulness of that part. Um, so then, <laughs> so then the, the king, of course, wants to hold a huge banquet thousands of people. He heard about how the other king in the other kingdom had a big banquet. And he's like, this is going to be bigger. <laughs> and uh, wants to have a huge banquet for his son, you know, has seven days to prepare. And it's, uh, he's already set aside. Uh, so beautiful. Again, this, the natural world is so entwined with this story and the teachings. And even outside these large kingdoms, there's so much natural forests. And that's where the Buddha and the bhikkhus always are living. And the king sets about to make sure they have some huts of bamboo and a place um, to be kind of meeting together for their practice. And in this huge gathering, there's thousands of people. Again, I just don't know how the acoustics work for Buddha to be heard, but I'm very impressed. And I like how they describe how he, he addresses, you know, this is, he is the, um, you know, the prodigal son, right? He's returned and all the kingdom is excited and eager and probably curious. The Buddha sat quietly for a moment in order to gain a sense of those present. He began briefly recounting his experiences and seeking the way as he knew people were anxious to hear what had happened to him in these past seven years. And then he gives a lot about always the, the same teachings, right? Impermanence and interdependence, the four noble truths, dependent origination. And then he goes into this, a couple stanzas here that I feel are just, just so beautifully described. And for those of us who've been coming consistently these last weeks, the teachings, they're not getting new, right? These are the same teachings. And yet he's offering them in these beautifully different um, settings, you know, these different ways of approaching. He says, your majesty and honored guests, all suffering can be overcome by looking deeply into things. On the path of awareness, we learn to follow our breath and to maintain mindfulness. We follow the precepts in order to build concentration and attain understanding. The precepts are principles of living, which foster peace and joy. So again, these precepts of not harming and um, all the ways that we can really ensure that we're being not harming to ourselves and others. Practicing the precepts, our ability to concentrate develops, and we're able to live with greater awareness and mindfulness. So the precepts are not only good of not harming other beings, you know, animals, not stealing, not being in um, non-consensual or harmful sexual engagements, but it's not only that it's good for others, but it actually helps our practice. And we've touched on this before, but you can't go around your entire day doing things that are counter to the ethics that are most important of non-harming and expect to sit down and practice and meditate, right? You're going to be filled with kind of the, like all of the energy of that, right? All the heaviness of that. So it's really good for our practice. Mm -hmm. Mindfulness nurtures the capacity to illuminate the true nature of our mind and our environment. With that illumination comes understanding. Just so beautiful. Uh, again, this kind of causal chain. The precepts help our mindfulness. The mindfulness nurtures our the capacity to illuminate the true nature of our mind. Hopefully we got a glimpse of that in practice, right? Paying attention and seeing or feeling that sense of lightness, uh, luminosity. Only with understanding can we love. Oh, sorry. So with that illumination comes understanding. Only with understanding can we love. All suffering is overcome when we attain understanding. 
The path of true liberation is the path of understanding. Understanding is pranya, pranja. Such understanding can only come from looking deeply into the nature of things. The path of precepts, concentration, understanding is the path which leads to liberation. But suffering is only one face of life. Life has another face, the face of wonder. If we see that the face of life, if we can see that face of life, we will have happiness, peace, and joy. When our hearts are unfettered, we can make direct contact with the wonders of life. When we have truly grasped the truth of impermanence, emptiness of self, and dependent co-arising, we see how wondrous our own hearts and minds are. It's really just that line, especially when we have truly grasped the truths of impermanence, emptiness of self and dependent co-arising, we can, we see how wondrous our own hearts and minds are. Part of that is when we're no longer caught up in our comparing mind, right? Our craving, our aversion, like, I really want that. God, I really hope that doesn't happen to me. Like we're, we have more availability for what's here. This ability to also kind of see the things that get us preoccupied, this frustrations, animosities, hatred, all of that has a sense of like me and the other, and that other is wrong. So our clear seeing, our recognition that anything we even want to be angry about or hold a grudge about, it's so complex. There's so many factors. There's us, there's that person, our experience and all of its things. And that when we have that direct contact with our um, with seeing, that all of a sudden the wonders of life become more available. We see how wonderful our bodies, the branches of the violet bamboo, the golden chrysanthemums, the clear streams, and the radiant moon are. Because we imprison ourselves in our suffering, we lose the ability to experience the wonders of life. We can break through ignorance. We discover... When we can break through ignorance, we discover the vast realm of peace, joy, liberation, and nirvana. Nirvana is the uprooting of ignorance, greed, and anger, the appearance of peace and joy and freedom. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's really just beautiful to hear him continue to share this message. And just as when he has been in other parts of the land in these last three years, he starts getting visits from so many people um, in his kingdom, many of whom become bhikkhus. So you have 300 new monks by the end of the first three weeks of him being there. Many of them upturning the social order are uh, men who are of noble status, who just clearly recognize a true feeling of peace of mind and freedom that they never had by following these, um, this training of the mind. And then his wife, uh, some of you may remember that his wife has always been really committed to kind of the social cause. She's always been visiting the villages and offering medical treatment for children. And one of the things that her and the Buddha talk about is her burnout right? There she is. She's recognizing the profound suffering around her. And she's trying to go and meet all of the causes of that suffering. And she can't, right? Like there's not enough of her and also it's out of her control. So she has this real crisis when one of the children she's been tending for dies. And the Buddha says, I have to go and find the way. There's got to be an end of suffering that isn't just trying to address the physical causes of suffering. And so he is very eager to share with her this new path. And Yasodhara made frequent visits to the Buddha, accompanied by the queen and her son. And she listened to his Dharma talks and in private asked him about the relationship between practicing the way and performing social service. The Buddha showed her how to observe her breath and practice meditation in order to nourish peace and joy in her own heart. She understood that without peace and joy, she could not truly help others. She learned that by developing deeper understanding, she could deepen her capacity to love. She was happy to discover that she could practice the way of awareness in the midst of her effort to serve others. Peace and joy were possible right in the very moment she was working. Means and end were not two different things. 
doesn't say exactly how to do it there, right? Really would love a little more instruction um, specifically, but just this idea that it doesn't have to be that, you know, the work we want to do in the world that's hard has to be separate from our practice of awareness. And whether that's our job or caring for a family member who's ill, like how do we bring our practice right into it? And something I've been experimenting with for the last couple of weeks is just kind of a, a momentary flashing into my awake nature. So it's really nice to kind of have five minutes a day to do that throughout the day. But for some of us, that can even feel like a high bar. Like, what is it to just have that momentary flash into your awake nature? Just kind of have that sense in the body and the mind and for me, I do find it helpful to just kind of lean back. But I think it's really, it's really interesting of we can get so far away from our awake nature throughout the day, distracted and busy and annoyed, right? All the flavors. So that that invitation to bring our awake into everything we're doing, quite beautiful. I just want to offer one last thing. I'm not trying to be so hard on, on Buddha's dad, but it just does crack me up. He just is like the last to get it. Um, so Buddha's younger brother um, and his son, they Rahula, they come to stay and spend some time with the Buddha uh, in the park. And his father, so his grandson's father, who has temporarily lost his grandson and son is, is, is very upset. He said, I suffered unbelievably when you abandoned me to be, become a monk. And then, you know, Nanda, your brother left me as well. I can't also bear to lose Rahula, your son. For a family man like myself, the bonds between father, son, and grandfather are very important. The pain I felt when you left was like a knife cutting into my skin. After cutting into my skin, the night cut into my flesh. After cutting into my flesh, the night ha knife has cut clear to the bone. I beseech you, consider your actions. And, um, you know, I, I really feel for him. And it's so tender. And again, like Buddha has a dad, you know, and his dad misses him. The Buddha tried to comfort the king by speaking about the truths of impermanence and the absence of a separate self. <laughs> she's like, she's not, she's not, not comforting. I, I could just see that, you know? <laughs> oh man. He reminded him that daily practice of mindfulness was the only gate by which suffering could be overcome. <laughs> Um, so yeah, the, the Buddha encouraged his father to appreciate their good fortune and to continue to practice the way of awareness. And then, you know, in the last days that the Buddha is there, he wants to return for the rainy season retreat, um, to, to the South and, um, one of the princes, uh, who is the, who's Buddha's uncle says, he goes in, sorry, the, the last thing he does is he goes into kind of the royal court where all the princes and the kings are deciding the fate of the land. And I haven't seen Succession, but I think it's something like that or Game of Thrones. Also, I haven't seen that. Like, it's a heavy duty, political, gnarly place. <clears throat> and Buddha goes in and just says um, that, you know, if you practice the way, you'll increase your understanding and compassion and better serve the people. You'll find ways to bring about peace and happiness without depending on violence at all. You do not need to kill, torture, or imprison people or confiscate property. This is not an impossible ideal, but something that can be actually realized. When a politician possesses enough understanding and love, he sees the truth about poverty, misery, and oppression. Oh, so inspiring. Such a person can find the means to reform the government in order to reduce the gap between rich and poor and cease the use of force against others. May it be so. Um, and so one of the one of his uncles says, um, I believe that you alone possess the character and virtue needed to realize such a path. Why don't you stay? 
and help create a new form of government right here in the Sakya kingdom, which will bring peace and joy and happiness to all the people. And the king's like, yeah, yes, I'm old. If you agree to remain, I'll gladly abdicate the throne in your favor with your virtue, integrity, intelligence. I'm sure all the people will stand behind you. And the Buddha smiled and took a moment and looking kindly at his father. He says, father, I am no longer the son of one family, one clan, or even one country. My family is now all beings. My home is the earth. And my position is that of a monk who depends on the generosity of others. I have chosen this path, not the path of politics. I believe I can best serve all beings in this way. And um, the queen and his wife are in this room observing and they are kind of like silently cheering him on. And uh, everybody else there is a bit crestfallen, um, but he is doing his best to impart this way of teaching and, and not try to do everything, right? He doesn't want to be the politician and the teacher. And, but um, yeah, I, I just found those chapters so, so tender, uh, how hard it is to um, seek the way of awakening. And in his case, attain awakening and still have all these worldly human commitments and, um, you know, be really gentle with them. So Let's take a moment to reflect on any benefit we may have experienced here together this evening. So also arguably the most important part of our practice is this exercise of offering, offering any and all benefit and merit from our time here together. And this symbolic offering is our recognition that our greatest hope and aspiration of our collected time is in service of all beings. That all beings could seek and find their own way of awakening. That all beings could know ease and peace. That all beings could truly be free. Thank you for your practice. And um, just a couple reminders, announcements. We are a volunteer run center and we exist off the generosity of you wonderful people here and online. So please offer what you can so we can keep the doors open here. And we also uh, completely exist off the generosity of our amazing volunteers. Please raise your hand, volunteers in the room, board members, woohoo, we love you, and online. So if you are interested in giving in a different way, like volunteering, you can talk to whoever raised their hand. Um, and we have some good stuff coming up. Yeah, thank you. 